Uh, Jeff Salzman here. Welcome to the Daily Evolver. It's uh, Wednesday, February 7th, 2018. And um, it's a beautiful day here in Boulder, and I hope you're having a beautiful day where you are. Today, I want to experiment a little bit with a project that I've been thinking about for some time. And that is to just sort of give my version of integral theory and its various pieces uh, as a sort of uh, daily evolver on ramp for new people or people who are new to integral theory. And, um, and there's, uh, you know, the, the podcast is reaching new people. And so this is uh, a, a, an episode in, in that, uh, uh, in that project. I did a talk yesterday with Steve Harper over at uh, What's Your Theory podcast, and we talked about the same topic in a more conversational way. Uh, so this will be a little more theoretical. And the theme, what we're gonna actually take a closer look at, is something that really is up in our culture and throughout the developed world, and that is this sort of resurgence of traditionalism, this the idea of traditional values, of more ethnocentric values, uh, nationalistic values, and, um, and we want to today take a little deeper look at that and to see the bigger context in which traditionalism arises. So we're gonna be doing a little bit of theory here today. So um, yeah, so a key tenet of integral theory is that human beings and collectives of human beings, uh, cultures of human beings, evolve through predictable stages of development. Okay, it's just basic integral theory, that evolution, it, it, we're, we're evolving creatures uh, in an evolving world, in evolving cultures, and that whether we're talking about each of us as individuals or as part of our evolving culture, uh, we all start at square one, and all cultures started, all culture in the sort of bigger sense started at square one, where we're born and we rise into, you know, human form uh, as a baby or as a, the first emerging human cultures. And we're merged with mother as an individual. As a culture, we're merged with mother earth. And we grow. And we grow first into a magical world of spirits, uh, where there's spirit in the wind and the, and, the, and the brother fox and sister moon and, and, and then there's monsters under the bed and we can turn a broom into a horse. And these are the first couple stages of development, which we call the uh, indigenous or archaic stage. And then the magenta stage or the tribal stage, maybe early tribal stage. And that gives way to uh, the warrior stage, which we call the red beam, where we break away from the tribe, uh, we break away from mother, we realize our power over the world. And individually, it comes online uh, like the terrible twos, at least in terms of the exterior behaviors, where we are really have low impulse control, and we want what we want when we want it. And, uh, and then we have another iteration of that, in the early teens, where our interior consciousness is sort of wild and crazy, and we have to civilize it in both cases. So, you know, when we talk about cultures moving from one stage to the next, or individuals moving from one stage to the next, we're talking about centers of gravity or probability clouds. So if somebody is at traditionalism, they have maybe 50% of their responses come out of that worldview. Uh, another 25% come out of the previous worldview, the red or warrior worldview. And 25% of their uh, responses come out of the orange or modern worldview. And, you know, there's some spiking up to integral and down to the basement. And, you know, so we're this moving, chaotic, developing self, developing in various lines of development, in terms of our cognition, in terms of our emotional body, in terms of our kinesthetic body, interpersonal skills, moral development. We develop in different lines of development, 
and not necessarily in lockstep. So, you know, when we talk about these stages, these are very gross kinds of uh, structures, but they're helpful, they're useful as models can be. Now, when we think about um, early traditional cultures, they're coming out of the warrior stage, which is in its early stage, it resembles more of a gang or militias or uh, some sort of a mafia state. Uh, just <laughs> I always think of imagine a world where uh, all the adults, everybody, the, you know, is the government, everybody, they're all 13. And, you know, you can see the progress that we've experienced in our world because now it's just our president is 13, but you know, it's progress. Uh, in later cultures, red cultures, you get into these great empires that uh, like, you know, Rome, Greece, where you can absolutely have very highly developed saints and sages, but the center of gravity, the culture is still very much in that warrior stage. So that's what traditionalism is coming out of. And, um, and you will find that, again, that traditionalists are uh, sometimes very comfortable in modern settings. They can work modern jobs. They can think it, it technically and, and, and they're very good. They look modern. But in their hearts, you know, it's still kind of God and country. And that's very significant. That's where their identity is, you know. So uh, just looking uh, a little bit more theory, in terms of this individual development, particularly in the early stages of childhood, we look at Piaget and he mapped this out, that we move through four stages in, in childhood. The first is the, in the first two years, which is uh, what he calls sensory motor where we're basically trying to find our feet and then we you know, learn how to stand up and walk and we can move through the world. And then we move into the pre-operational stage, which is toddlerhood. And that's like two years through the next four or five years. And we are able to manipulate symbols. We can do magic. We can, again, the broom is the horse. I can put on a, a cape and fly. Uh, but you're not really much good in manipulating the real world and, you know, actually getting things done. You're not supposed to. Uh, and this is true of tribal. Tribal is very low technology. You know, they're just really living off of the land. They're in the present moment. Uh, and it's not to say that there can't be uh, lines of wisdom that come online. Absolutely. But, you know, in terms of the center of gravity, it's still a magical world of, you know, symbols of, of everything has meaning in, in, in that symbolic way. So then we move into the concrete operational. And that's what we're talking about when, when a culture and an individual moves into what we would call the traditional stage or the amber altitude in spiral dynamics. It's the blue meme. And here you're able to manipulate concrete objects and see the world as a, you know, an array of objects that are different from oneself. And um, hang on one second, there we go. And you, you could bring a certain logic and common sense to the world. And, um, and that you know, brings on all sorts of power. And for an individual, this is age seven through 12, roughly. And in terms of culture, it started, we had sort of some early, stages of it about 5,000 years ago, but it really came online about 2,500 or 2,000 years ago. And let me just, just to keep the sequence going, after concrete operational, the ability to manipulate objects, concrete objects, comes formal operational, which is moving into the modern uh, world. And that is the orange altitude. And that is the ability to manipulate abstractions or ideas. But that's not big yet in terms of traditionalism and concrete operational thinking and functioning. So anyway, uh, if we look at cultures, you know, what is it that after years of tribal sort of merged identity where the individual is really not that distinct from the tribe, uh, that all of a sudden 
people start defying the spirits and the elders. And they realize that they have powers beyond that. And, you know, we see that there is um, just sort of a natural growth that arises. And it arises in terms of consciousness. You know, you, you've got concrete operational down. You're ready to move on. There's an erotic force. There's a force of growth in the universe and in, in each of us. And we just can't, can't help growing. And we do, and we civilize ourselves in a new way. And we allow for far more complex systems and ways of thinking. And one of the big emergence is in terms of the lower right quadrant, uh, the, the exterior of the collective, the systems of the world, and the big emergent that brings on and is brought on by traditionalism is agriculture you know, the ability to actually have a fairly far more stable uh, system of calorie delivery, not necessarily nutrition. And, you know, there's all this controversy that agriculture was a big mistake and a wrong turn by humanity. Really? I mean, it has its downside, but it allowed what it allowed, which is far more complex systems. And then there's, you know, systems of governance that arise. And and what we see that is that, you know, we move from a uh, might is right, and that's the warrior point of view. There's no laws really mediating my behavior. And we move into a right is right kind of thing. And, and we can see this, there's sort of some, you know, hints of this in the animal kingdom. And we see that uh, in, uh, there are tribes of, or bands of chimpanzees and bonobos where an alpha figure rules. And he was always a male. This alpha figure rules until a group of betas figure out that together they're stronger than the alpha. And then they come in and they tear them apart and they take over. And there's a new set of, of, of rules or thinking that come in. It, 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 maybe not, you know, overtly in, in the animal kingdom is it certainly not as it is in the human kingdom, but uh, research, shows that the, uh, the post-alpha bands of primates are more stable than they were when the alpha was in charge. So there is this idea of a new kind of organization that comes online. And then also a new kind of thinking in the upper left, the a new uh, consciousness that is the, um, uh, the awareness of a conscience this idea that there is a right and wrong way to live. There's this new world that comes online and we find ourselves in it. And uh, one of my favorite uh, descriptions of this is from a book that was published in 1999 called The Way of the World, From the Dawn of Civilizations to the Eve of the 21st Century. And it was like, I don't think it was self-consciously so, but it was one of those sort of early big history books, which seeks to draw these big patterns in history. And of course, as a, as a nascent integralist at that point, I was you know, riveted by it. I love the book by David Fromkin. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer, so it got you know, a lot of mainstream respect. But here's what he said. He talked about uh, the Axial Age, which is about 2,500 or 2,000 years ago in, in that era. And, uh, and it's where the world turned on its axis, as Ken Wilber would say. And uh, we, we moved from the descending religions, the religions of nature and, and depth, the pagan religions, to an ascending religion where truth and uh, justice and vengeance and all of the things that have plagued humanity are sorted out by an uh, almighty God who is all good, and all fearful and uh, is ruling the world and created us. And our job is to serve him. And all of a sudden, our life has meaning in a whole new way. So anyway, here's how he put it. He says, one of the greatest revolutions ever in human affairs took place about the middle of the first millennium BC. And again, this is 2,000, 2,500 years ago. Initiated independently by a number of different people, far away from one another and unaware of one another. I think that's debatable now, but at any rate, 
He said, it was the development of a conscience in religion and philosophy. The early Sumerians and Egyptians, and later the Greeks, believed their deities to be powerful masters, to be feared, bribed, and placated, even though their traits were all too human in the worst sense. The gods were often pictured as vain, jealous, jealous, foolish, ill-tempered, and unfaithful. The shift in view from that vision to one in which the universe and its deities were seen to be informed by morality and salvation was a kind of revolution. Why it happened, and why it happened when it did, around 400 to 600 BC, are among history's greatest mysteries. And, you know, it's funny. We just can't help but grow. And, um, and so uh, he points out that I just will do a quick overview of where and how this happened. It, it happened in China with the arising of Confucianism. And this was in the sixth century BC. Very legalistic, uh, based on the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it's a very, it was very civilizing. Uh, the, <clears throat> one of his mottos was live like a gentleman. <coughs> And a gentleman is a, a, a man who has civilized his violent impulses. So there's a gentility in the best sense of the word. Uh, Greece, <clears throat> he talks about Xenophanes rejected the idea that gods have human natures and proclaimed there is one God and taught spiritual purification. In Iran, uh, Persia, came Zoroaster, Good and evil, heaven and hell, defended the weak, uh, 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 exhorted people to feed the poor, be kind to animals, mm -hmm. and was very uh, formative of Christianity, which came a little later. In India, uh, Jainism, pacifism, all things have souls, reward for good behavior. Again, this is all the sixth century BC. Hindu Upanishads, good behavior, good rewards, in India, Buddha, uh, you know, with the, the eightfold path, right speech, right action, right effort, uh, and all of, <clears throat> excuse me, all of this provides merit for a good rebirth in Buddhism. And of course, in the Middle East, we have Jesus uh, and Christianity and this idea of extending salvation to the whole world and loving your enemies, and of course, the golden rule, and obedience, and all of the good stuff that, um, you know, basically civilized people. So this happened all around the world, uh, sort of at once, uh, in historical terms. And, um, and I'd like to, uh, lest you forget how powerful this realization was, this move from the red warrior stage, where might is right, to the world where God, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world, and right is right. And uh, my job here is to be God's soldier on earth. And, uh, and here, we'll, here I will share with you an experience of this realization uh, where we have, hang on, an actual uh, video of this happening. In, um, in ancient Israel. So here we go. Unto thee, O Israel, you have sinned a great sin in the sight of God. You are not worthy to receive these 10 commandments. against you, Moses. You take too much upon yourself. We will not live by your commandments. We are free. There is no freedom without the law. Whose law, Moses? Yours? Did you carve those tablets to become a prince over us? Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me.
So, you know, he won them over. And, um, and that's the way I think people are at some point are ready for it. Hedonism is boring after a while. Some of us have had firsthand experience with that. Uh, you know, sometimes the golden calf just isn't as alluring as it used to be. And what's actually happening is that society and your own psyche is stable enough that you want to move into this new kind of freedom. And I love that. There's no freedom without the law. And the law just opens up this whole new space of, of life, of world, of, you know, actual territory that human beings can, uh, accom you know, that will accommodate a bigger human being. And there's new meaning and new power. And, um, and I just want to take a quick look at the Ten Commandments. Uh, and here they are. And you can see that the first four are all about basically riveting people on this idea of this new God, this transcendent God, or in Buddhism, there's, the, there's a sort of a system, there's a way the world works. So that, that is this transcendent um, uh, nirvana that we want to aspire to, this freedom, this liberation. And so, you know, the first is have no other gods, uh, no graven images, don't take the Lord's name in vain, remember the Sabbath. So you're carving away a, a day, you're, 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 you know, nurturing this awareness of this new God. And then come the six that are basically prescriptions for right living. So honor your mother and father, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, and don't cover your neighbor's stuff or wife. <laughs> so um, that was great news at that time and created a whole new world. And, um, and I love uh, some of the descriptions of how that arises actually in terms of us as individuals. You know, we see how it arises in culture, but it, in, in, in individuals. And one of my favorite books and uh, an essential book for people who are integral practitioners is Spiral Dynamics, of course, written by uh, Don Beck and Chris Cohen. And here, I'm just going to read a couple of things that they said about the arising of blue, in, or what, what they call the blue mean. In, in Ken Wilber's um, Aqua Maps, it's the amber altitude. Uh, but at any rate, it's the traditional stage of development. And they write, a single guiding force controls the world and determines our destiny. Its abiding truth provides structure and order for all aspects of living here on earth and rules the heavens as well. All of a sudden, my life has meaning because I follow the appointed pathway. I stand fast for what is right, proper and good, always subjecting myself to the directives of proper authority. I willingly sacrifice my desires in the present, desires in the present, in the sure knowledge that I look forward to something wonderful in the future. And then they write, when the blue meme or this traditional stage takes firm hold, one feels the joy of purpose, reason, and direction in life. And I love that idea of this, you feel a joy of purpose. And I think a lot of us could relate to that uh, in our own development as individuals. And um, I think of my childhood when, you know, and this comes online again around seven, eight years old, when I would go to church camp and, you know, we'd have fires on the riverbank and sing songs. And I felt so lit up by the love of Jesus. And, um, it felt I knew what my purpose was. I wanted to serve God and create God's kingdom on earth. And in a more secular example of that is Boy Scouts. And, uh, and I remember the, how I wanted to always be prepared. And I wanted to do my duty to God and country and obey the scout law and to help other people at all times and, and to keep myself physically strong and morally straight and mentally awake and and how exciting that is and what how that allows us to, to be a bigger person and um and so that's 
the sort of individual individual realization of that and sometimes that's for some people that's where they really just want to stay they development is a funny thing nobody knows why some people move forward into more full modernity or post-modernity or some people are arrested at you know pre-traditional down in the red warrior stage in important ways um, but regardless everybody gets to be where they are and that's one of the great insights of integral is that we want to appreciate people where they are and i i you know how you get these things in the internet i i, I got somebody sent me this thing uh that i thought was such in, in a way a beautiful and, and, and in a way naive uh way of thinking about traditionalism in, in, in describing it in the way that a lot of people really resonate with as adults and go through their whole life. And it was called Happy Memories. Do you remember these? I do. And here it, it goes, she says, when mom, I don't know why I think it's a she, it could be a he, but it's just one of those internet things. But the idea is, when mom was at home, do you remember when mom was at home, when the kids got home from school, when nobody owned a purebred dog, when a quarter was a decent allowance and another quarter was a huge bonus, when you'd reach into the muddy gutter for a penny, when all of your male teachers wore neckties and female teachers had their hair done and wore high heels, when you got your windshield cleaned, oil checked and gas pumped without asking, all for free, every time, and you didn't pay for air and you got trading stamps to boot. Remember when stuff from the store came without safety caps and hermetically sealed, uh, hermetic seals because no one had yet tried to poison a perfect stranger? Go back with me for a minute. Before the internet or the Mac, before semi-automatics and crack, before Sega or Super Nintendo, way back, I'm talking about hide and seek at dusk, red lights, green lights, kick the can, playing kickball and dodgeball until your porch lights come on. And mother may I? Red Rover, hula hoops, roller skating, running through the sprinkler. Race issues meant arguing about who ran the fastest. Money issues were handled by whoever was the banker in Monopoly. Catching fireflies could happily occur at an entire evening and it wasn't odd to have two or three best friends and being old referred to anyone over 30 and the worst thing you could catch from the opposite sex was cooties. So anyway, this sort of nostalgia that is, uh, you know, you could sort of feel, I, I grew up, I resonate with that. I grew up with that. A lot, the, 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 the sort of naivety of that is that a lot of people didn't grow up with that. And the race issues actually meant different things. And that's a bigger, more clump, complex view and yet less reassuring and sort of less warm and more anxious. But, you know, growing up, that's part of the deal. And that's, uh, you know, why we say that evolution is beautiful, but not always pretty. So anyway, uh, just a couple thoughts on how we apply this thinking to today and, um, and, and how, how we can see it at work and how we can, as integral practitioners, practice, um, you know, feeling into the great realization of traditionalism and, and how it was such great progress for humanity and for each of us as humans. And to appreciate its sort of dignity and obedience and faithfulness and propriety and restraint and discipline. And, uh, and to see that that's appropriate in the culture and, and needs to be brought back into the culture in ways that leave behind its all their exclusivity claims basically, that their one traditional way is the only way and that other people are on the other side of good into evil. And so we don't want that piece. But so, you know, if we just look practically, there are, uh, you know, ways that we can support healthy amber or healthy traditionalism in our institutions. Uh, like I think of, uh, you know, religious programs in prisons. And you know, should we do government funding of, of programs that take people off the streets uh, and, 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 but yet have a, a religious overtone to them, like the Salvation Army and that sort of thing. And that those are healthy 
uh, traditional values for people who need them. People who are uh, unable to function are people who are outside the, the, the norms of criminal marginalized behavior. What they often need is the discipline of traditional religion and even fundamentalist religion. Uh, and, or they need to go, you know, sort of a time honored way of civilizing out of control teenage men who are going around getting in fights and getting drunk and knocking over mailboxes and whatever is to go to the service go to the army or the Marines and get disciplined and get woke up and that into traditionalism. And so we want to appreciate those things in ways that don't have the sort of conflicted uh, embarrassment or, or the idea that the postmodern liberals often have uh, that there's something that is um, lesser about them. They're, they're, they're very important pieces of building a, a solid uh, structure for new development. And uh, we want to support traditionalist thinking. Uh, I, I think of um, somebody who's getting a lot of attention these days, and, and I've had a lot of you send me videos uh, and articles so forth about this new public intellectual, Jordan Peterson, who has just written a book called uh, The 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. And I gotta tell you, you could hardly crowbar more traditionalism into an eight world word title than that if you tried. Rules for life, rules, very important uh, aspect of traditionalism. You know, we wanna civilize ourselves. An antidote to chaos, and, and that's, you know, what are the ways that traditionalists see the pre-traditional stages? You know, in the, in the, in the Ten Commandments movie, uh, you know, they're, they're all down there, you know, feeding each other grapes and writhing around in their grandma underpants and, um, you know, uh, worshiping the golden calf. And it's just chaotic. You can just, it's, you can see it, it's chaotic. And so he comes online, this Jordan Peterson, with a message to particularly young men who have not really gotten the memo. And, you know, there's a whole strata out there uh, where they're, they're really not engaging in life. They're not moving out of a sort of a lethargic or uh, aimless, um, sometimes, uh, you know, addicted, uh, whatever, all of the pathologies of red uh, warrior culture. And his 12 rules for life starts with rule number one, which is stand up straight with your shoulders back. And that's sort of the tone of his message. And, you know, clean your room, tell the truth, hang out with people who want the best for you, get a job, <clears throat> bring order and discipline to your life, connect with a bigger purpose. And, you know, he's really doing God's work in, um, in, in helping bring this online. And I'm gonna talk more about Jordan Peterson. I actually have the book arriving, I'm thinking tomorrow. The, it's sold out at the Boulder Bookstore. So I think it's kind of interesting and good news in a way. Um, <clears throat> from what I've seen, I think that, you know, he, I, I'm not sure he has a, 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 an evolutionary view in the way that I would hope. Uh, and, you know, I think he's uh, in a zero-sum battle with liberals and post-modernity in ways that don't appeal to me. But I'm going to hold off until I uh, t had a closer look at his book because, you know, I'm seeing all these videos and stuff. But anyway, I know he's of interest to a lot of people. And I think he's, a, you know, basically, I think he's doing a great thing. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, 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 maybe there's a good distinction here that you don't have to be in, you know, uh, doctrinaire integral thinking to be moving the ball integrally. And one of the ways that the culture is going to move forward is by re-installing, uh, re-respecting these, you know, building blocks, these the, the traditional strata so that we can, you know, uh, see it and appreciate it for what it is. And again, leave behind its pathologies as we build a more integral world. Anyway. Uh, I, I think another thing we can see is that you can't skip stages. And that's why 
you know, you don't want to take somebody who's at red and try to move them into green. Uh, that's a big mistake that green makes all the time. I can remember uh, at um, uh, when I was at Naropa, the Buddhist university, I was doing the Masters of Divinity program. And, you know, they would try to bring in people who were marginalized and on the streets and whatever, and teach them meditation. And it was uh, generally not very successful. What was successful was going and living uh, on the streets. And that was, we would call them street retreats. And uh, that uh, had more success. But at any rate, you can see even in terms of cultures that in the Middle East, uh, you know, one of the pathologies of the Middle East is that tribal societies had oil. And so all of a sudden modernity comes in and installs, you know, so, sort of a pacified modern system uh, that was actually oppressive. And, um, and they haven't developed a good traditionalism, a healthy traditionalism. And, and moving into a healthy modernity. I think we're seeing that, and I think we'll definitely see it with the younger generation. But you can see that this, you know, skipping stages, we want every stage to be installed. And, um, and yet it's a chaotic system, and they're not installed that way. And we don't move forward in any kind of a lockstep. We move forward in terms of, of um, you know, a chaotic system. Uh, so, I've been prattling on for a while here, but I do want to say this one last thing about Trump. Uh, you know, part of this, the inspiration for this and why I emphasize traditionalism so much is that, you know, you have to think that during this, this Trump era, you know, where there he is, he's actually center of gravity red, in my opinion, but his followers and the people who love him are largely uh, traditionalists and because they have a common enemy, which is the postmodernist. Uh, but, you know, people talk about Trump being shameless. And there's an interesting distinction here between the red warrior stage and the blue saintly stage, or the, you know, the fundamentalist traditional stage. And that is shame is actually very powerful in red. But shame means having shame brought upon you, looking weak, uh, having small hands. <laughs> You know, that sort of thing. And you're always wanting to prove yourself and look big and powerful and so forth. That's, you know, the currency of red. And so, you know, Donald Trump is exquisitely attuned to not being shamed or looking weak. But what he is is guiltless. <laughs> and that's blue. And that's, or the, uh, that's moving into the amber traditional stage of development. And that's this idea of knowing that you've been bad and that you have disobeyed and that you're falling short of the ideal and of God's expectations. And that's a very, very powerful emotion. And Trump doesn't appear to feel any of that. Uh, I think we could sort it out. There's, there's uh, one of my favorite horoscopes from The Onion, which is, of course, a great American humor newspaper uh, on, uh, online, too. Uh, and they always had, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have a horoscope that were hysterical. And here's the one I love that I think really helps us sort out this, uh, this difference between shame and guilt. And it says, the debate over whether we have a shame or guilt-based society is complicated when, due to an odd set of circumstances, you kill a man by shitting your pants. <laughs> All right. So I'll leave you with that little chuckle. And there's lots more to say about all of this, of course, but I just want to, you know, put some of the theoretical markers down so we could have a bigger understanding of what's going on here and how people, you know, the world space that our brothers and sisters live in, and we do too, uh, and we, or we want to in a healthy way as we move into um, an integral stage. All right. Thanks, folks. Uh, see you next time on The Daily Evolver. Jeff Salzman signing off.